Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1972 film Night of the Lepus. And actually, when I'm recording this review, it's on Easter. Uh, I'm definitely releasing it after that, but uh, it just feels very appropriate. Now, I watched it days before this, and this is my first time seeing Night of the Lepus. It's a film that's been on my list for quite some time because it's one of those films that I've heard about here and there over the past many years, and it's just been on the list for a while, and Shudder just added it for the month of April, so I was very excited to finally check it out. And Shudder actually has a bunch of these films that have been on my list, so I'm going to slowly be working through those. Now, let me go ahead and say, if my energy level seems lower on this than usual, I'm not feeling the best. Uh, my allergies are out of control, plus I haven't slept all that well the past few nights, so my energy level may be lower. That also goes for the uh, review I'm putting out for the film Shockma, also on Shudder. Uh, I just recorded that same day right before this, so just a disclaimer there. Anyway, uh, Night of the Leap is directed by William F. Claxton, who also directed Half Past Midnight, Young Jesse James, the Twilight Zone episodes, a few of those, I think like four or something, lots of episodes of the show Bonanza, it's an older show, if you're much younger you were like, what's Bonanza, and lots of episodes of Little House on the Prairie, which I was subjected to a lot when I was a young kid because my sister really liked to watch it, and I was there, and she had the remote, so... It's crazy thinking that I watched so much Little House on the Prairie then, and now I finally watch Night of the Lepus, and it's the same director. It's just kind of interesting how those things connect. Written by Don Holliday and Gene R. Kearney. Now, Holliday didn't have any other real credits. Uh, Kearney had done scripts for Night Gallery, as well as a bunch of episodes of the show Kojak, which I've heard really good things about Kojak, and I've been meaning to get to it. Also, that is one that's been on my list. You know, not a movie, but a show. Uh, but that's been on my list, so got to get to that eventually. So this was based on a novel by Russell Braddon. Uh, the novel was actually named The Year of the Angry Rabbit, which I think is a better title than Night of the Lepus. Obviously, they went with Night of the Lepus because they wanted to capitalize on the Night of the Living Dead phenomena, which a lot of films ended up doing that because, you know, marketing, it's a thing. <laughs> but... This film had a few different titles uh, over the time that it was being worked on. Initially, I think it was just called Rabbit. They got away from that. Then it, it was called Leapers at one point. Actually, I think when it was in script form, it was just called Leapers. And then when they were working on it, they were calling it Rabbits. Uh, but then they ended up going with Night of the Leapus. Now, apparently the term for Leapus came up when, and this is just what I found on online, so take, take it for what it's worth. It was a situation where one of the producers was reading the script, he spilled some wine on it, so he couldn't actually read that it said leapers, and he thought it said lepus. Which, by the way, lepus, I believe in it, Latin means rabbits, basically. So that's, you know, that's where it comes from. Now, one of the big things is they wanted to kind of steer away from, uh, with it, like, the marketing material and everything prior to the film coming out. They wanted to get away from really mentioning rabbits all that much, so that's why... When you see the poster art for the film, it just has all the eyes in the dark. It doesn't actually show rabbits. It doesn't say anything about rabbits because they felt that if they were marketing with the whole rabbit thing, that people would just think it's so dumb and ridiculous and not see the film. Now, that said, when they were showing the film as little promos, they did give out little uh, rabbit's feet with fake blood on them. So, I guess cool promo thing. I, I kind of miss the days of... Well, first of all, I miss the days of theaters, but I miss the days of theaters kind of doing promo type stuff like that. I wish that would come back once theaters are fully open and we're going back to them. Uh, Janet Lee, uh, who is one of the main is the main female lead in this film, uh, sh she did not want her kids showing up on set because she didn't want them to be um, subjected to horror films. They, she thought that was, it would be too scary, potentially it was too much of a problem, so she intentionally kept her kids away from horror films. Now, the funny thing about that is that, yes, this is the Janet Lee from the film Psycho, the original Psycho, which is a wonderful film, as we all know, and one of her kids was Jamie Lee Curtis, who would go on to be very famous for horror films, so I just found that tidbit of information pretty funny. Uh, Lee actually didn't care for the film. She, in many interviews, had kind of said she's forgotten a lot about the film. She seemed very disinterested in it. And, in fact, she's even stated in the past that she had uh, only taken the job because it was 
pretty close to her house. So it was a paying job pretty close to her house, and she wanted to be able to spend plenty of time with her family during that time. But other than that, she wasn't really a fan of the film, which I can't really blame her, because it's not like a great film. You know, it's, it's a weird, dumb concept, and it's ridiculous, and obviously it's like fun to watch now, but back then people were probably like, eh. And actually, people were like, eh, because when it actually came out, it didn't do super well, and critics didn't really like it either. They It got pretty much dismissed as being ridiculous, which is, you know, kind of what they were afraid of if they led with the whole idea that, hey, it's killer, giant mutant killer rabbits. It doesn't sound like a good concept, really. <laughs> but yeah. Um, the rabbit roaring in this film, whenever there's roaring going on with the rabbits, what was actually going on is they were filming a rabbit yawning. And knowing that and watching the film, you can definitely see it. So you're just kind of like, oh, that's cute when it's supposed to be you know, scary. But in general, I just think rabbits are, are a type of animal that like, they're just so cute and fluffy and wonderful that anytime you see them, you're just going to think cute and fluffy and wonderful. And that's what happens in this film too, is when they're supposed to be menacing, they don't really look that menacing, to be honest. And in the moments where they had red on their faces, which is supposed to be blood, that was ketchup. So it is good to know they didn't do anything like using paint because there were not great things done in the past, uh, especially, you know, many decades ago as far as using animals on sets. Hopefully the bunnies were treated relatively well. Um, I do know that they used about two dozen rabbits, and the shoot took about two months. And over that time, they were just kind of holding on to these rabbits. Uh, it changed from being about two dozen rabbits to being close to a hundred rabbits, because yes, they are well known for breeding, and yes... They did breed over those two months, so that's crazy. So um, I guess it helped the film, in a sense. Apparently, there was a, the Mystery Science Theater 3000 guys slash Rift Tracks guys. Uh, apparently, they did an episode on Night of the Lepus, but I couldn't find it on the Rift Tracks app that I have, so I wonder if it was a Mystery Science Theater 3000 thing and it's not really available anymore, but if you know about that, put it in the comments. Let me know, because I would love to see this with a Rift Tracks treatment to it. It screams for it. All right, so the news report in the very beginning of the film kind of really does set the tone in, in quite a few ways for the film. Really, it's a pretty good example of kind of an invas invasive species issue, which obviously they set up as talking about it in the context of Australia, but the film ends up taking place in Arizona. But they use the Australia situation of overpopulation of these rabbits and destruction of crops as kind of the the stage to set of saying well over here it's a huge problem and then they introduce it in Arizona and you're supposed to remember basically it from that report it could become a huge problem now it goes to a problem of epic proportions because of the intervention of science in this film because science decides to get involved do some experimenting and accidentally cause a much larger mutant rabbit problem which goes to kind of the heart of the theme of this film which is humans messing with nature and what can end up happening because of that. I mentioned my review on the film Shockma that's coming up. Same type of theme in that film as well, which is humans' ability to think that they can control nature completely, but they really can't, and also just doing experiments on nature for, their, for humanity's gain and really what can end up going wrong when that happens. Um, there's also a bit of a point of kind of, you know, testing on animals and it not being great, especially with the little girl Amanda wanting to save the rabbit who had been tested on and that's what, you know, he gets loose and that's what ends up causing this whole big, literally big problem. So yeah, there's also a question about human overpopulation uh, in the, during the news report in the beginning, because there is something said very briefly in the very beginning of it about human population getting a little bit too large as well. So there's a bit of a parallel between rabbits breeding and humans breeding. And yeah, that's always been a problem. We've always been conscious to a degree of overpopulation, but not willing to talk about it so much. And we're still going there. So just, just saying. I know the guy shooting his horse in the beginning was actually supposed to help demonize the rabbits from the get go, but they show the rabbits, they look so cute. And I was just thinking, isn't this kind of more the fault of the horse? Because the horse is running, there aren't blinders on it or anything, it can see where it's going, and it steps on the rabbit holes 
and falls and the guy shoots it. So I understand the intention, but for my brain, I was like, isn't it kind of the rabbit's fault or the, not the rabbit, the horse's fault for not watching where it was going. And also to a degree, the, the guy riding it, I think it was Roy. No, that wasn't Roy. That was Cole. Cole. That's who it was. Just saying. So Roy, and he's the scientist. He ends up bringing up DDT uh, and using natural ways to control invasive species. Now, he makes that kind of comparison, saying that DDT is a problem, trying to get away from it, talking about using more natural ways to control species issues, especially invasive species. Now, you need to keep in mind that Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, came out in 1962. For people who haven't read that book or aren't aware of it, it's an environmental science book that was groundbreaking that brought to light a bunch of information very negative about the chemical DDT that was used to control large overpopulation or pest pest issues. And it had all these negative effects on all sorts of other wildlife that became a very big issue. So people, you know, society was really trying to get away from DDT was very, um, it was DDT was very much in the minds of people. So when they referenced DDT in this film, that's something that's been talked about for many years leading up to this film as being a bad thing. So they kind of use that to pivot and go to like, well, let's try and do things a little bit more natural. But then Roy ends up using science and messing around with the rabbits, which causes the problem. So, and I think he's just doing hormones is what he was doing with the rabbits. Uh, when the rabbit bites, when the, there are a bunch of rabbits being moved over, Roy and Cole are working on that once that they had caught because they were going to test them. Uh, when the rabbit bites Roy, I think it was Roy or it may have been Cole, I can't remember. I felt like that was kind of foreshadowing the issues that were about to come of the rabbits being a little bit aggressive. And then what happens when they become so much bigger and they're even more aggressive because they're super pumped with hormones. Why the hell would this kid switch the rabbits? Yeah. So I didn't really fully understand why Amanda decided to switch the rabbits in their cages it didn't really make full sense to me, especially when she was asking if she could take a rabbit home. My only thought is maybe that she wanted to, in her mind, kind of save the rabbit who she thought was going to be in peril because she didn't really like the idea of the testing, so I guess. But wouldn't she then just think that the other rabbit would end up being tested on? Because I don't know. It didn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. And then what makes even less sense to me is when her friend, it's a dumb scene too, when her friend is just like, oh, let me see that rabbit. And then he just like lets it loose. And obviously that's where, you know, it runs into the ground, start breeding with other rabbits. And that's where the problem comes. But that scene just felt so weird. Like it didn't feel natural. It didn't feel like it really fit. And that kid doesn't even really play much of a role in the film either. He's just there to be the catalyst for the problem. You know, like he caused the problem which, you know, further backs up my kids are terrible thing because Amanda took the rabbit and that stupid kid released the rabbit. Granted, he didn't know what he was doing, but still, it was a jerk thing to do. So, at any rate. After finding Cap Captain Billy dead, the nightmare Amanda has is actually pretty funny. Um, I just found that whole montage of her having that nightmare pretty hilarious. There are some moments in this film I, de I genuinely laughed at, and that's why this is a pretty good, so bad it's good film, in my opinion. I like how the rabbits are sneaking around in the dark. Uh, it's interesting because they're not nocturnal. Some people think they are nocturnal. They are a bit more active in, in the evening and night, supposedly, but they are seen plenty during the day as well. And that he, the film even starts that way, obviously, before the, the horse is shot. But um, I just did find it interesting how, like, for a lot of the time, they're just, like, lurking in the shadows, especially in the cave. Uh, I think that was mainly done because they want to kind of... They wanted to keep it darker where the rabbits were because they didn't want to expose so much how potentially bad, like, the, the miniatures that they set them on to, uh, so that when they were bigger, they could, like, terrorize the town. I think they wanted to kind of minimize how well lit those scenes were so people wouldn't recognize as much that they were like painted miniatures. They wanted to keep up the illusion that these were actually gigantic rabbits so that when you're watching the film, you could get more sucked into it. So I get it. I get it. It's just kind of funny that they're just like sneaking around. Um, <laughs> the truck driver's body is actually a pretty grisly scene, and I was impressed for this time period and for what I assume they would be doing as far as the practical effects go, especially with already seeing, you know, just the ketchup on the mouths of the rabbits. Uh, but I was impressed by that, the, the truck driver who was mutilated. Now, that said, whenever there are mutilated bodies that show up after that one, 
they're not really mutilated. They're literally still intact, even though they say they're mutilated, just with, you know, fake blood on them. So I think that kind of sucks. They went big, and then they stopped. I like how they say the dead people... Oh, I literally just said that. I like, I like how they find the breeding ground in the cave. Like, rabbits kind of need privacy to bone. That's another funny thing I thought. They literally call it a breed. Or like, oh, it's their breeding ground in the cave. I don't, you know, I don't think rabbits feel like they need privacy, but I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe you know. Put in the comments. Do do rabbits primarily have sex underground? I don't know. This isn't something I looked into. Maybe it's something I should have. The attacks on people they show are awesomely funny. Uh, it literally was a guy in a fake rabbit suit. Um, obviously, they do as much as they can to not show as much. Like, they just show, like, blurs and bits and pieces, but... It's just funny, like, you see the rabbits coming at him, and they cut to, like, the, the fake rabbit being thrown at him, and then the guy in the suit, like, wrestling with him. I just love those scenes. They're they're so, like, corny and stupid, but I love it. It's funny because a lot of the footage of the rabbits just looks the same. That's another thing. And, and that's one of the things I kind of think gets a little boring about the film, actually, is that you're seeing the same type of footage over and over and over of the rabbits just, you know, coming at the camera or just looking around on the miniature set. Although I will say that the miniatures and like the, the miniature town that they created did look pretty good for the film, in my opinion. They really did. Oh, excuse me. Uh, between attacks, it does get pretty boring. Like I said, there's a lot of the same type footage. It gets boring. The film really does drag because it's just people trying to run from these gigantic rabbits. Um, and the film is like an hour and 28 minutes, I want to say. And it does feel like it drags a little bit, so that kind of sucks. I also would not pick up a hitchhiker in a desolate road waving a rifle around. That's a really small part, but there's the part where I think it's Cole is trying to get a um, get a ride, and he's literally waving his rifle. There's no one around, and there's one car coming, and he's just like trying to flag him down. And they're like, I'm not picking that dude up. And I'm like, I wouldn't pick that dude up either. either. There's nobody around, you don't know him, and he's waving a rifle. Nope. I, I don't blame that family. I love the shot of all the bloody rabbits just hanging out around the body of the lady in the general store. And by the way, when that lady in the general store first gets attacked, that's probably one of my favorite scenes because you're seeing the rabbit coming and then all of a sudden you see the fake rabbit like break the window and come through at her. It's just the way it's cut together, it's really funny. And then that after scene of all the rabbits just kind of around her with all the ketchup on their faces just like... They're supposed to be eating her body, I guess. It just looks funny, and I, I enjoy it. Ah, yes, the typical hit-the-whole-town-with-rockets approach to solving things. That always shows up in these types of films, especially with large-scale problems like giant animals or giant insects or whatever it is. And that was a whole period. Like, there were, for, the, for decades, for a few decades, there were a bunch of these films of, like, giant creatures of different types. You know, like the giant ants from them and stuff like that. That's one that my mom would talk, talk about a lot. She remembers seeing that and it was scary to her back then. Um, the officer with the bullhorn yelling that a herd of killer rabbits are on the way just seems like something people wouldn't pay attention to. I guess when he was yelling this, this was it was supposed to be at all people who are already fleeing these giant rabbits. But it just made me think, if there's someone who, uh, uh, even a police officer who shows up and is like, you need to get out of here, there are giant killer rabbits coming... Who's going to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People are just going to be like, what? Is this guy nuts? And then you start thinking, this probably isn't even a police officer. It's probably just some crazy person who's dressed as a police officer. I like how the military shows up really quick. Even if they believe what was actually going on, it probably would have taken them quite some time to get there. It seems like they get there like the same day that the giant rabbit issue happens. Um, I don't know if that's how it was supposed to be, but that's what it seems like because of how they edited it together, but uh, response would not be that fast. The electrified train track solution, I think, was pretty creative. I did like it, and I will give them points for that. I thought that was kind of cool. It's a good way to kind of bring the film to a close, in my opinion. Like, what else are you going to do for giant rabbits? I don't know. I mean, I guess that's all you could do. Um, obviously, this is about population control and how fragile ecosystems can be, especially with uh, the introduction of invasive species. This is actually a problem not from back, not just from back then, but it's a problem now. You hear all the times about things like the murder hornets. We just heard about murder hornets 
that had shown up. But I live in the state of Maryland. We have a big problem with snakeheads. They're a type of fish that are invasive, and they overrun areas and eat all the food for local species uh, that were they were supposed to be able to have, and it causes a big problem. It causes de- huge depletions in native fish populations. It's it's not it's a problem. It's it's a bad thing, and they have been you know really encouraging people to go out and catch snakeheads so much so that they've actually this I think the state released a um, cookbook of recipes for snakeheads they also did that with nutria we have a problem with uh they're kind of like muskrat like creatures nutria in maryland and they encourage people to go out and shoot shoot nutria and once again they put out a cookbook of here are some recipes to use for nutria it's interesting it's also about humanity versus nature and how humanity can make things so much worse when trying to overcome nature. That's another thing. There's always been this situation of humanity feeling like it can control nature and it should rightfully be able to control nature. Now, you can't always win though, and that's the problem. And we see that in real life when it comes to, you know, we build structures as best we can to withstand the harshness of weather, but Inevitably, there are always those times where tornadoes, hurricanes, you know, whatever, they hit and it can't be stopped. So this is kind of one of those themes where you can do whatever you can to try and get around the issues that are created by aspects of nature. In this case, the overpopulation of this invasive species of rabbit, but you could either end up trying end up making it worse or it's just not going to work. And inevitably, you're going to have to pay the piper, so to speak, and it's not going to be good. Uh, if you want a good double feature for this, I would recommend the film Octoman. Because watching this film, it had a lot of that same feel. So, And if you haven't seen Octoman, look for it. It's, it's ridiculously bad, but so bad it's good. Now, if you want a triple feature, I'm going to recommend tacking on to that the film Squirm about killer worms. <laughs> Uh, It's amazing. It's amazingly bad. I love that film. Uh, It was on Shudder. I don't think it's there anymore, unfortunately, so you'd have to try and find it somewhere else. And then if you want to get crazy and have a quadruple feature, tack onto that one giant spider invasion, which I know for a fact got the Rift Tracks treatment, and that's a really fun time. Plus, I mean, you don't even need the Rift Tracks, honestly. It's hilarious on its own. Oh, and actually, Octoman also had a Rift Tracks, so... I'm just saying, that's a great quadruple feature. Uh, Especially if you do that, put some comments down here and let me know if you do a double feature, triple feature, quadruple feature on my recommendation. Let me know how that goes if you do. But, would love to hear your opinions on Night of the Lepus. I'm glad I finally watched it. Don't really feel the need to watch it again, especially not now. Maybe if I have like a friend who really wants to watch it, I'd sit down and and watch it with them and kind of laugh a bit. Make some comments here and there to pass the time. But, it was good. It was a good watch once over. So, out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to rate this two ways. Uh, in the pantheon of all film, I'm going to give it one and a half stars, and I'm going to give it that extra half because I think the miniatures actually looked good, quite good. Um, but as a so bad it's good film, I could put it at a like a three. I think I think it's a solid three as far as so bad it's good. I was between two and a half and three, but I'm going to give it the three. Because it is pretty funny. Those giant rab- those giant rabbits are definitely not really menacing. <laughs> I'm just saying. They tried their hardest, but they're just not menacing. But I really appreciate you taking your time to check this out. Go ahead and put comments down there. Let's talk about it. Do me a favor, though. If you're watching this and you are not a subscriber, please hit that subscribe button. It really does mean a lot to me, and it helps to drive me to continue to do this. Because I'm not ma- making money or anything. I'm just trying to put my opinions out there. Hopefully people find them useful or entertaining and also looking for comments. I want to talk and get nerdy about horror stuff. Where I live, I don't have many people I can talk to about that. And that's been one of the reasons I created this channel because I want to talk horror with people and in depth too. So please subscribe. I do appreciate it. Also hit the notification bell if you do. And that way you'll know that when I'm putting up another review like this or an unboxing or haul video or opinion piece or whatever, I'm always doing all sorts of stuff. But regardless, like I said, I really thank you for taking your time to watch this. And until next time, keep it brutal.